Hello and welcome to Masterclass number 17. My name is Morag Gamble from the Permaculture Education Institute. Tonight's topic is all about how to cultivate your design eye and see the permaculture possibilities. If you're here for the first time for a Masterclass, this is something that I do every month on the, on the last Monday of every month to take a topic that has been chosen by people from the Permaculture Education Institute or people who have taken a previous masterclass and we explore a question that, um, that has come up and there's been a question um, from many people. So this is, this is why I've chosen tonight's topic and I'm looking forward to, to diving into this. Uh, so just to give you a little bit of a background, in these sessions, you're able to open up the chat on the side and introduce yourself. So please go ahead and do that. Um, and you can also ask questions there that I can answer. I'll try to answer them throughout the series, but also um, I can come back later if I miss them and, and to talk to you and talk to you about the, the questions that you have. So um, just to give you a little bit of a background, I'm I actually did landscape architecture. Um, many decades ago now um, and I have been a permaculture designer for about 26 years. So I do permaculture design and I teach permaculture design and I teach permaculture teachers and also work with uh, community projects and help to facilitate collaborative design projects and what we call citizen design projects. So um, design is something that I'm really passionate about and design is something that I think takes a takes a time in a way to cultivate that sense of of seeing a landscape in a particular way and actually learning to read the landscape and and how you can work with the landscape to create a, the best fit. So this series of, of master classes are sponsored by the Permaculture Education Institute. They're free. Um, and available for for everyone. Um, as you know, you, you're able to sign up for these for free. So please let people know about them. Um, when you see the next notification come out, spread it as widely as you can. I think this time we have about 1,700 people registered, which is absolutely fantastic. Of course, not everyone can come at this time because there's people from six continents joining in to, to these sessions. But if you're joining in now, Hello and welcome. And if you're joining in later on, um, welcome too. And if you if you're not able to chat because you're joining in later, you can actually ask questions below, and I I will try to address those as well. So welcome to all of you. It's so great to have you here. Um, so as you can see, then I'm I'm Morag, and I'm the founder of the Permaculture Education Institute, which has an educators program, and the link is there. I also run a, a YouTube and a, and a blog, and there's also lots of really um, fabulous free information there that you can access through ourpermaculturelife.com for the blog, or if you search for the YouTube, um, just look up Our Permaculture Life, Maura Gamble, and you'll find your way there. And also within the Our Permaculture Life uh, suite of things, I have an incredible edible garden course, which is a permaculture introduction course. Um, and I'm also the director, executive director of the Ethos Foundation, which is a permaculture charity I've set up to support uh, women and local farmers in different parts of the world. And these masterclasses um, are not just for adults, they're for young people as well who are interested in looking at finding practical and positive solutions to the issues we're facing today or to transform a landscape or to grow food or to be a, 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 a practical activist. Um, these are my, my kids here, Maya and, and Hugh, and they've both received permaculture design certificates. Hugh was 10 when he got his and Maya was 12, and, and they did that with me in, in Africa last year. So actually going through and, and taking a permaculture course is something that is a really valuable skill for young people, and I'd like to encourage you to support young people to do this because it helps uh, young people in particular to, to find positive solutions to the issues they're facing in the world right now and there is a lot of climate anxiety going on. It's also a very practical skill that they can carry out in the world with them and whatever they choose to do, this the systems thinking, the connected thinking, the, the nature-based thinking, the 
practical solution oriented approach is really valuable in whatever they choose to do. So I just wanted to encourage you to really embrace this idea of working with young people and encouraging young people to get involved in, in permaculture. And so if you've got some young people who are in and around your life to engage them in this process. And, and it's amazing actually, when, when you start doing that, the creativity and the innovation and the lack of blocks that they have in their mind helps you to overcome some of the things that um, you get stuck with. And so this is kind of the question for today, which is about, you know, do you feel like you're getting a bit stuck in designing your place? Um, I get the question quite often about, well, how, how do you see what the possibilities are when you can't see past what's there? You kind of get stuck. Um, and so this is the, the topic for today is really about looking at how to get unstuck in your design. Um, I have done some previous masterclasses, which I will put links to in the, in the recording of this. Um, where you can look at the design process and some of the other masterclasses that I think will support and be relevant to the discussion um, from this one. So <clears throat> what, what's stopping you? What are some of the things that might get in a way? Are there some existing structures or garden beds or fences that are just limiting your thinking? Or is there some existing vegetation that's blocking your flow or blocking your view or blocking a pathway or there's some pathways that are there that are kind of in the wrong spot and not connecting up your landscape or your design in a way that's helpful. Perhaps it's simply that you just don't know what the options are. You, you know, we only know what we've been exposed to. So perhaps it's just, you know, maybe we need to open up a little bit more because you can only imagine what it is that you've seen and and been exposed to in that way. So we're going to look at that a bit too. Um, perhaps too, there might be some differing expectations in your household, which in that case, this whole idea of collaborative design, I think is a really important one that getting everyone involved in the design and finding a way to actually come to a, a shared agreement about what the directions that you're going to take. So in this context, Permaculture design, <clears throat> we're looking at it as a really adaptable tool for finding practical solutions to some of the problems that you're facing and to really underpin these with ethics and principles that are based in ecological system and to really come at it from the intent that you're wanting to regenerate that space and create a sense of well-being for your life, for your family's life, for your community life and also for nature. So it, this is kind of the, the, the starting point that I think that we need to focus on is intention. So who and what are you designing for? So are we designing, are you designing for, uh, to improve the soil? Are you designing to create an abundance for nature? Are you designing to create an abundance of food? Are you designing for your children to create spaces? Are you designing... Uh, for future generations? Are you designing simply to create a beautiful and relaxing place for you? Uh, you know, if you're watching this as a recording, maybe just stop at this point and jot down a few things about what actually are you designing your garden for? What are the key things that you really, really want this space to be for? And to be clear about that before you move on into the design stage. And and if you actually want to step back a step and, and pause at the at the blockages point too and really be clear about, you know, what do you feel are your challenges and, and what what are you struggling to overcome? So um, take the time with this. It's really important, I think, when you're in the design stage is not to rush your way through it, but actually spend the time. The, the, the more time you spend in the design and the contemplation stage and the observation and visualisation stage, I think you're going to end up with a much better um, outcome. And often when we do dive in and try and rush forward, that's when we do find that we get, we get blocked with our ideas. So I wanted to begin here because one of the most important things about designing from a permaculture perspective is that we're really looking at how we can condense our footprint 
our human footprint on the landscape, on nature, as much as we possibly can. And that our core aim is to protect and regenerate as much wild space as possible and to protect and restore wildlife pathways and corridors and find the, the actual minimal amount of space that we need rather than spreading out and using all of our space that we have access to for our own purposes. Think about what's the minimum space that you need so that you can actually help to restore the natural environment that's in and around your place. And this is really important considering we are in the midst of the sixth um, extinction, mass extinction. And so the impact that we are as humans, as humanity globally having on the planet is so huge, so enormous. If everywhere that we are in all our gardens and our homes, we are thinking about condensing our footprint, regenerating the wild space, connecting up with the other wild spaces around and regenerating these places. And in doing that, we're not just regenerating the, the landscape and the habitat for other species, it's also creating an enormously healthy um, human habitat as well. And so context is important. And I mentioned before about thinking about broader than your own place. And how does your garden, how does your plot relate to, um, relate to your neighbourhood and to your region? So you might want to hop onto a, a Google Earth image of your place and zoom out, zoom out and see where it is that your garden is located in context to your rivers, to your parks, to um, catchments and really try and get a sense of your bioregion and your neighbourhood and how where you are is connecting to that. And this is a picture of um, North East Street City Farm in Brisbane, actually. It's one of the projects that I was involved in getting started, gosh, maybe 25 years ago now. And it's really interesting when you zoom out because when you're in the midst of that garden, you feel like it's this amazing oasis of, of this permaculture food frost. And you zoom up and you realise actually that you're very close to the one of the biggest spaghetti junctions in, in Australia and a massive yard, um, rail yard and there's industrial areas going on everywhere and there's really not much other green space around except for this the, corrid, um, the corridor of the river. And so this is a really important place in terms of, of, of its habitat value as well. Um, so really think about where you are in that place. We often get caught by the boundaries that we've created for ourselves, by our fences, by our property boundaries, by our sense of what we can just see around us visually. So use the tools that we have, like Google Earth, to be able to, to take a, a bird's eye view and see where you are. And in, in that too, I really encourage you to zoom in as close as you can. And, and perhaps you already have some plans of your place that you can use or if you don't you can if it's a small place you can um, step it out and scale it out or get a tape measure and, and work out the, the size of your plot but if it's a if it's bigger than that and you don't have a plot you can actually um, grab a google image of a place uh, this is one of the places at crystal waters and you can zoom in and you can actually get a piece of tracing paper and go over the top of that with with some tracing paper so print it out and then go over the top with a piece of tracing paper and mark on where the structures are maybe where the existing trees are where the existing pathways are and existing boundaries and then you have a base plan that you can start to work so you've got your whole site and it's really great to be able to start to sketch and design and and Play around with, with what you can fit into that space as you're starting to walk and move through that space. So we'll get more to this later, but I wanted to mention it now because I really do encourage you to, to get a sense of the whole your place as, a, as an entirety and get a sense of your place in the context of your region. 
So once you've done that, then it's time to come down into the garden and to really start getting a close look and, and knowing your site well. Now, through the process of des um, the design that we do through the Permaculture Educators Program, so we do a permaculture design certificate course and then a permaculture teacher's course second, but in the permaculture design course, we spend a lot of time actually in the process of design. And what, what people are finding is that the, the more that they get to know their site well, the influences, the abundances, where the sun's coming from, where the flows of water, the sources of water, the sinks, um, where the main winds are coming from, the strong winds, the gentle winds, what are the different microclimates, um, what resources are available there, uh, what are some of the, the needs that your site has or, or the users of your site have or the, the species that you're wanting to attract to the site have, what are the flows that you notice of energy through the site some of the natural cycles and habitats that exist. We, we go through this quite extensive process of site observation and it's kind of the biggest project as, as the course. And, and I've noticed that the, the more focus that people put on doing this part of their project well, and, and it's also, you know, when I've worked with, with um, clients as a design consultant, the more that they spend that this time doing this part of it well, the design almost falls out of, of this process because you get to identify what are, the, what are the challenges, what are the opportunities, what are the possibilities. You start to see past some of those initial things that you see <clears throat> as, as, as blocks or the things that you just don't see because you've not spent the time observing them. So I really do encourage you to observe and get get to know your site well and and spend as much time as you can connecting with your site just being out in the garden and over the time you really get to get a sense of a feel for it and I and I mentioned right at the very beginning about actually um, starting to read the language of your landscape you get to know when certain plants are, are flourishing that that means something or when you know, you, you get to know where the water flows because as soon as it rains, you're out there and you're observing where the flows are and where it's pooling and where it's it's running off and if there's any erosion. Just actually being in the garden and being outside there, connecting and observing. But I want to encourage you to take a step back from being that, that observer to just being there and playing and exploring and and, and imagining, you know, I quite often like to find little spaces in amongst the garden where you can just sit for a while and you just imagine, you know, the, the what if question. Oh, I wonder, what if I, what if I put a structure there as a, an outdoor area? Or what if I planted, a, you know, some fruit trees along this section? Or, or what if I created a swale just below here? Um, what if I... I created a playground for the children in this space just start playing with the ideas exploring um, watching what happens watching where the birds go listening to the different sounds around and and really connecting and it, I can't I can't emphasize enough how much it is just getting outside and once you start to get outside and do this you really start to enjoy being in the space and you really start to know it, it just really helps you to see your landscape differently often we have a very functional land uh, functional relationship with our landscape and we we design it we race it, we manage it but just being there is different it's a really different relationship that we're wanting to come now in order to move through some of the ideas uh, sorry move through some of the blockages that you have you need need to feed your imagination you know what are the you know if we just go out there and we're looking around and we're just feeling a bit blank and there's not enough I don't know not enough inspiration to for us to really help to make this design flourish and be the most beautiful thing that we can create the most abundant garden that we can create then we need to go and fuel our imagination by 
perhaps going and visiting other gardens. So one of the things I love to do is to go around and visit as many different people that I know who've got permaculture gardens. And you've noticed on, on the YouTube channel that quite often I take my camera with me and I, and I film that. So, you know, going to people's places who have established gardens or even people who are just starting out too, because there's something about every different person has a different interpretation or an idea or they've solved, solved a problem differently or they use different plants. So find the people, particularly in your local environment, who are using the types of plants and strategies that could be translatable to your environment. And so I, I really encourage you to do that. So if there's local open days or you've got friends or neighbours or maybe you've got a local permaculture group that does visits around to different places, join in on those and, and go and visit them. Or maybe there's school gardens you can go and take. Or perhaps there's um, community gardens that you can look at. Also, a lot of um, around where I live now, um, in the southeast Queensland area, a lot of libraries have um, community gardens attached to them and neighbor, neighbourhood centres also have community gardens attached to them. Um, and even some of the, uh, the botanic gardens, that's the word I'm looking for, um, uh, have edible landscape sections as well. And so just go and visit as many gardens as you can to get inspiration. And so you maybe visit the gardens in in person, which is the ideal. Or if you if you look if you can't get to them, you know, go and visit gardens on YouTube channels like the Our Permaculture Life YouTube channel or other channels that you can find. And go and work with others too. So maybe you've got perma perma blitz days or community garden days or um, you know at at a friend's place. Go and go and hang out with people who are doing gardening who have got gardening happening offer to help them go and get you know one of the things I did I said I went to landscape architecture school but it actually wasn't until I started working with people in the community garden down at Northeast Street City Farm that I think that I really started to learn what permaculture meant in terms of its practical application and I learned so much about plants and their uses and which parts are edible and how you prepare them from all the different people from all the different cultures and places um, <clears throat> and the different applications and different design ideas and solutions and so it's this idea that as much as possible to just connect and even if we're you know we're not really outgoing maybe there's ways that you can do it that are you know less less confronting or just do it with a friend um, and invite people over. Invite people to come to your place and share ideas with you. Invite them to come in and, and give you some input put on, on what they know about plants or walk them through your ideas of what you've got for some designs and ask them what they think. Um, so that's friends and neighbours and your family and particularly if you're trying to get you know the, your family together on board with you to to look at what, what you're going to be doing and that's your kids and your partner and, and anyone else who's living in and around your household to, to invite everyone to be part of this design process and to give in ideas and to, to toss them around until something sits and feels right that links with the, your observations and links with your ideas about condensing your footprint and then gradually it refines. And so one of the things too that I encourage people to do as part of the, the site analysis and, and getting prepared for designing a site, and thanks to Donna, um, if you're watching this, for, for this mood board, and, and, and it's that, to create a mood board. As you're going around the gardens that you love, um, people's places that you see or you've seen something on the internet, something that you like, gather and snip the pictures and create a collection of images that will inspire what it is that you're trying to create in your design. So this is your imagination board. You can make, you can do it digitally or you can have a pin board and you can stick up pictures so it's there in front of you and that it's there to, to fuel your imagination and to keep keep the ideas fresh and and um, and start to, to you know, really uh, identify the, that quality and the, the texture and the... I know the materials that you're after and the 
because a, a permaculture garden is a practical and it's a functional thing. It's about you know regenerating landscape, regenerating soils, growing food, reducing our energy consumption, uh, living lightly on the earth. But it can also be incredibly beautiful and incredibly soul nourishing being in that place if we think about our design. And so as you can see from, from Donna's mood board, you know, just the, you know, the edgings of the plants or the, the combinations of plants or having water features and, and um, you know, little seats and interesting paving and, and lighting and outdoor spaces. So we can create the most beautiful, encouraging, nourishing, entertaining, practical and positive space that we can. And in order to do that, one of the first things we need to think about is not just go out and put in a veggie garden in a fenced off area like we saw in that very first picture. But what we need to do is find the nodes and the flows. So what I mean by this is where are the areas? What are the most important areas? And I often encourage people to start with not, not necessarily the garden areas, but what are the people areas? So, um, you know, once we've identified what the wild spaces are and we kind of, you know, put that towards nature, within the space that we're going to occupy to meet our need, create the human space in the middle. So maybe the play spaces, the seating spaces, the, the areas that we move through. So the nodes and the flows and how that connects and how we move through the space. And then the gardens start to hang off that as as the structure as the skeleton of your of your design and it's almost like having the the sort of the organs and circular the circulatory system set in place and then from that we we flesh it out and and that just makes it so much easier so just simple so you can do it if you've got a an the plan that you've drawn before, you can start to, you know, just draw areas and get the flows happening. Make sure that as you're moving from one side to the other side, this was when we were doing a design for a community garden in um, in Yandina, and just making sure that all the different areas and the different meeting spaces and the different um, gateways all lined up and were the flow worked really well and as you entered into the space there was the main areas that needed to be close to the entrance and, and the zoning of permaculture rippled out from there. So it's so a sketch and play and, and you know keep rubbing it out until you feel happy with how it's going. Um, and you might want to get in and actually paint it up as well and, and really bring a bit of colour to it. There's some really simple little watercolour pencils you can use or even um, little tablets that have uh, little water pens that you can use as well and and they're just very simple way to do it so what I'm encouraging you though to do is to actually do it to scale because one of the biggest mistakes that I find people make is when they put in they they do a design but the trees are actually way out of scale or the tank is way out of scale or the structures are out of scale and so you might think that you can fit a whole lot more in Whereas actually, you know, you've only got space for a few trees, for example. So you can see at the top, it's a very simple scale. It's it's hand drawn, but it's measured up on a on a, a on a proper a scale rule. So what that means here, you can see that if you measure this, if you draw this on, so you can see that there's uh, five meters and ten meters, and you can see there's one, two, three, four, five. So whatever size that is, whether you're scaling it up or scaling it down, you've you stretch it um, in different ways that that scale will always stretch with the drawing and so it will stay true. If you just write 1 to 100 as a scale, it's lost as soon as you've printed it out if it's in scale. And always put the put your north on as well so you know which angle you are. So those are two things I always encourage people to do whenever they're doing design. The other thing to do too is to really think about so before you get to this point of, of drawing it in in pan and painting it up is to really think about the size of the trees. So if you're trying to fit in, if you've done, you've done your wish list, you want to include, you know, 10 fruit trees and you've got them all listed and you want to have um, a seating area, an open area and some vegetable beds and a bit of an outdoor kitchen and whatever it might be. 
draw them up to scale. And sometimes it helps to actually have them as little pieces of paper that you've drawn to scale. So you'll cut them out as a little shed or as a tree. And you can see right here on the left-hand side some big native trees there. And they're massive, absolutely massive. Quite often we're tempted to draw them as tiny little circles and, and that just doesn't work. On the other side you can see there are some, there's a dwarf food forest up the other end. So those trees are quite small. They are literally only a couple of metres in diameter. But the big trees, you know, they can be up to 10 metres in diameter. So this scaling is a really important thing to keep in mind. Um, and, um, and have fun painting it. And, and it's a being, doing it creatively. And as you can see, this is not a complex drawing. It is simply just um, the areas and the spaces and some colour and it brings it to life. And it can help to engage your family in as well. Now, the other thing that I wanted to mention too is that if you're looking to create some sketches and it's really a great way to communicate or to help you to imagine what the design might be. Um, so you can take a photo of a site um, and then, or you can even take a series of photos, a panorama and, and print it out and then get some tracing paper and put it over the top and you can sketch your design over the top of that. So what, it, what that does is if you feel that you can't draw and you can't draw to perspective and you, 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 know, you just don't feel confident at all in that, and, and you know, believe me, most people do, to, to good, do a good sketch on the side to get a sense of what your design is going to look like and to communicate that to, to other people in your family or your group, to take this photo or the panorama, do the sketch over it with tracing paper. And then you will get the perspective, you'll get the scale, and you'll get to have a sense of a design that you can colour in and, and show people. And I really do encourage, encourage you to not reach for computer design packages straight away. Stick with the hand drawings because they're quick, they're easy to do, and they they somehow tap into your creative um, thinking far more readily. The other thing is that I find that the computer packages straight off do end up limiting, you know, what you can do. They seem to, you end up with a lot more boxes, you end up with a lot more monocultural site, sort of trees, whereas when you're just sketching them, you can um, really be creative with it. Um, a book that's excellent to help you in doing simple sketching is called Landscape Graphics, and I will put a link to this at the bottom of, of, this, um, of, of this talk. Now, the other thing that I really want to encourage you to do too is to make your design visible. And by that I mean get out and walk your design. So once you've actually laid your design um once you've got your sense of what your design is, you can go and lay it out on the ground. Now, this is an example from Turkey where we were doing a collaborative design project for a group that had been given this rectangular space by the local council to do a community garden. After a series of design workshops, the plans and the ideas of all the different groups were brought back together into one design and, and presented back to them. And, and I could see, though, that a number of them still didn't really get a sense of what this plan was about. So we went straight out onto the site and we started laying it out, out the design with chalk. So we had some chalk in a bucket. I think it was an old paint can actually and with a little hole in the bottom. We just walked along until we, uh, out they sort of created where the pathways were, where the little allotment gardens were going to be, where the central pond was where the, the food forest area was and they mapped it all out onto the site. So you could do a similar type of thing. You know, this the these this community group was given an absolutely blank site and so you can kind of do that there. Um, whereas in your garden it might not be possible. So maybe you might want to use something like stakes and ribbons and, and a string line and get a sense of that. Or sometimes I've even actually gone out to people's places and, and We've laid out hoses. We get big long hoses and we, we map out where the pathway is going to be. And I get them to keep moving in it until they're really happy with it. Or we do that when we're marking long contour um, 
plantings, you know, get the stakes out and mark it out so that as we've laid out the contours, we can see where each of the rows of the trees might be going um, down the slope. So make your design visible. And before you do any major digging or maybe major construction, just check it, walk it, make sure that, you know, imagine you're in the future, five or 10 years down the line, and you're, you enter the garden from, the, from where that main entrance is, and you want to start to um, you move your way through the space and see that it's working, see if there's any blockaging, blockages, make sure that the, the site is permeable. You know, maybe you want to really um, burst a hole through that fence if it's something that's really blocking you. Or maybe you need to, um, you know, change where the, the edges are. You can see at the front here that decided to, to move that, that um, pathway there. <clears throat> so walk it, make it visible, change it until you're happy with it. And it, it really does help to overcome that, those, that sense of, of what's possible on site. And it helps you to, to, to lay it out, to visualise it, to explain it to other people. And then I'd encourage you to take your time and start small. So you may have a design that is, is laid out on your piece of paper and it looks beautiful and you've marked it out on your property and you great, okay, now I'm, I'm going to get this all happening. But I really do encourage you to start small. Start and where you can closest in to the most um, easy to get started, productive, useful space that you're going to be eating out of right away and then keep observing your site. So get the bit started that's easiest to get started, start close in. So you might start by replanting in the wild zone and getting your little vegetable garden happening close in. And then keep observing and ripple out your design as you go and you become more confident and you become you get more observations and start to build up the soil in that place. Because one of the big problems too that, that blocks our imagination is sometimes just the the lack of fertility in different places or the, the lack of water that's in, in different sections. So you might need time to activate the soil or to set up a a water collection redistribution system to enliven soil to hold enough moisture in the soil. So, you know, start to do soil regeneration strategies in the areas that you're going to move into so that by the time you get there, you're, you know, your garden's really going to start to thrive. So don't feel like you need to, to, to do the whole thing at once. Um, really keep that observation, keep that connection um, building and evolving over time and learn learn the skills because you know you might have gone to someone's house and plants that work there just don't work in your place and and it's a it's a microclimate thing or it's a, a soil thing things shift and you know it's very you know particular to your site so get to get to know and get to learn what really works for you and then cultivate a community of prep. so you know often it's really nice to go out and to garden by yourself and you know it's a very meditative thing and it's a very calm thing but sometimes you just want to go out and have a whole lot of fun with a whole lot of other people and get some jobs done or learn learn from what other people are talking about or, or engage some young people in in learning with you so cultivate um, different groups so maybe there's maybe you have a permablitz group or maybe you have a friends group or maybe you have a, a family gardening day or maybe you know you you organize camps with local schools to come out and do some some work with you there's so many different possibilities and the thing that with all of these every time you you engage with other people in your garden or you engage with other people in theirs make sure you keep this open questioning enjoyable process of, of continual learning happening and being continual uh, learning and observation with nature in your place too. So I encourage you to, to really dive in and, and learn as much about permaculture as you can. So the, as I said before, there's the Our Permaculture Life YouTube, there's the Our Permaculture Life um, blog. So there's at least 100 films and a 400 articles there. Um, I have the 
incredible edible garden course and it's a practical uh, permaculture gardening course that's available and also this design course the online design designers course so there's people in six continents now who are actually taking this online permaculture course and working towards their permaculture design certificate and their permaculture teaching certificate and some people are uh uh, finished through this now it's a new course that started about a, a year ago and um, it's absolutely fantastic to see the amazing work that people are doing there's people from uh, like I said all around the world but all different backgrounds from uh, people working in marine permaculture to people researching permaculture at universities to people um, doing community gardens or school gardens or home gardens and really looking at different ways of, of being a permaculture teacher too and at the moment my um, younger student is 13 and I really encourage young people to 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 get involved in this uh, a number of homeschoolers are participating in this in this program and I'm really excited by that because as I said before I think actually exploring permaculture design and permaculture design thinking underpins um, a really systems thinking approach to life and a positive approach to finding um, solutions to the issues that we're facing. And I also uh, encourage you to look at the work that we're doing too with the Ethos Foundation. So the Ethos Foundation is a small permaculture charity that I run and it is primarily focused on supporting people to access permaculture education in places where it's not available. So as much as I can um, donate permaculture um, courses, the online courses to other parts of the world, in some places they don't have access to the internet, not in a way that will enable them to, to be able to stream the videos and download the materials. So what other ways, you know, I start to ask what other ways are there that people can access this type of information. So that's where the Ethos Foundation can into play and we've just sponsored this um, group of women to run a, a free permaculture course in Kenya for local women and farmers uh, so there was 30 graduates who received free permaculture education and they're now going out into their communities to ripple out that work and so I only I only um, support groups that I know personally and I know that they're you know they're they're a real project and they're committed to making a difference. And it was this women's group that I was involved in um, supporting last year. And um, so I, I knew exactly that what they were going to do, where they were doing it, and that they were absolutely brilliant and committed, an amazing group. Um, so if you donate, why well, I'm telling you that is because if you do donate to um, the Ethos Foundation, I can guarantee that every cent that comes in goes directly to the people and to the communities and spread out as far and wide as possible. So there's um, we're just looking at a number of um, new programs they're running um, to, to educate more young people in particular in becoming permaculture educators and designers um, and again another women's program and also working with Indigenous Australian communities who've asked for some permaculture education too. And again, we only go where... Um, there's been an invitation. We never head into a community and say, we've got a great idea for you. Um, it's always when people say, you know, this is the sort of information we need to access. So I'd welcome you to, to donate to the Ethos Foundation, which, as I said, is a permaculture charity that I'm, um, I'm the executive director, director of, and so I'm involved in selecting the projects and directly collecting the funds and distributing the funds to these people. Um, anything that you can donate um, goes, as I said, directly to these people. So the website's there and I encourage you to go and have a look and, and I would thank you very, very much for any um, donations that you do make. Uh, so just in summary, looking back over this uh, topic that we've been exploring today, which is about how to actually cultivate your design eye and see the permaculture possibility. So the first thing is intention. So being clear about who and what you're designing for because that I often find that without having that clear intention, there's a 
there's a temptation to race out and start doing the gardening and then getting stuck. And so being clear right from the start is really important. Making sure that, number two, that a core part of what you're doing is connecting up with the natural flow of your bioregion and of your neighbourhood and helping to rewild your space as well as part of that. So that even though it's, it's on your property and on your block, that you're putting as much as possible back to nature and, and to create a, a natural habitat. To spend as much time in observation and understanding your context and understanding uh, what's what are the challenges and what are the opportunities. And then to once you've got a sense of your space, what you're working with, to head out and to fuel your imagination with whatever you can, with site visits, with, with working bees, with uh, visiting gardens and community gardens and searching on the internet, just researching all the different options, taking a course, getting as much information that you can to fill your cup so that you have, you, you feel like there's possibilities that you can draw on, abundant possibilities you can draw on. And then start to draw it, map it, and don't feel like, oh, I can't draw, you know, even simply with, as I mentioned before, to get the flows and the nodes, so that circulatory system of your design, it can be simply bubbles and lines. And that's the simple, you know, that's the, that's the core of it. And then you can add detail after that if you feel like it. So get your bubbles and get your lines, get your circulatory system happening and your organs of your design. And once you've got a sense of that and you've done as much as you can with that, start to walk it it out on your site and then start small start close you know take your time take your time to really cultivate your connection and to to build up your ecological literacy of your site and build a community of practice around you gather your friends and your neighbors maybe take down some fences in between your places and poke a hole through those fences and, and really start to get rid of some of those boundaries that exist in our landscape that are, that are kind of unnecessary boundaries. Um, and just love it. Enjoy your space out there. Find those little niches that just make you happy. A little reading spot, a little breakfast um, nook, a, a little play space for your kids. Find ways to make your garden, your edible landscape, your functional landscape the most beautiful and happy place for you um, so that you're not fighting it and that you're actually loving being out in it and it brings you joy and it makes you feel happy and that you know that actually as you're doing this, you're adding value, you're restoring the landscape, you're restoring the soil, restoring nature, restoring habitat and, and it's this purposeful, practical, positive thing to do. Um, so I wish you all the luck with that. And um, I hope, you know, maybe I would love actually for you to send me pictures and, I, and you know, things that you do in your garden, how you, how you overcome the, the blocks that you've had and how you've been able to, to see past some of the challenges that you face. So thank you so much for attending. Um, the next masterclass, as per usual, will be on the last Monday of the month in September. And I'm going to put up a couple of uh, suggested topics uh, for those who are attending live. Um, and I'll let you select from those. And the one that gets picked the most will be the topic for, for next month. Um, and don't forget to go and check out the materials on the Permaculture Education Institute site and also all the materials that are available in our Permaculture Life. Thank you so much for being part of tonight's session. Um, I look forward to seeing you next time. Um, I'm Maura Gamble from the Permaculture Education Institute. Have a great night. See you.